Hello and welcome to Movies, Films, and Flicks. I am Mark Hoffmeyer and joining me is a man that is wearing a red, green, and blue outfit for this episode. It's Nick Rehack. How you doing? <laughs> Hanging out just nice and bright, colorful. You're looking great, man. Thank you. I appreciate that. Just appreciate that very much. You're looking very memory. You, you desaturated your background on your Skype here that I'm looking at. Like You basically went full memories of murder for this episode. And I planted a whole field of crop, but unfortunately it didn't grow as quick as I wanted to. So I'm keeping the window closed so people don't see the uh, disappointing amount of lack of crop. Oh, man, It's pretty dry in Baltimore nowadays. It, it's funny you say that. We haven't had rain in a good two weeks. We could use some. Not to sound like that 50, 60-year-old person that's like, man, we could really use the rain. But no, we really could use the rain. What's more frightening, tall grass or tall kind of oats? Like, or like what, what's more – like, what, what is this? I have it. What's, what's scarier, a tall grass of reeds to you now or the tall grass? Because in Jurassic Park, the Lost World, we have the tall grass scene. And in this movie, we have the reed field scene where the guy's hiding in the background. You see his head, comes out, jumps a lady. What's what's scarier for you right now, Nick? That right now, (laughs) that's one of the most terrifying things I've seen on film in a long time. That scared the absolute hell out of me when that happens. It was, I mean, just wow. I'm getting chills thinking about it now. And part of me doesn't want to think about it. Like, it took me a little bit to fall asleep after watching it. I'm not even going to. It was it was so just intense and powerful and still at the same time, if that makes any sense. That's why I mow my lawn every week. And that's why I only visit my family farm in Iowa in the winter because all the crops are go. gone. I don't mess with Oof. corn. I don't mess with tall cornfields. Children of the nope. corn, quiet place. You know, you just don't mess with corn. Scary movie nope. three, stay away from tall crops. Field of dreams. Yep. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to tell you something, Nick. Okay. I plow my field to make a baseball field. Mm-hmm. My, my corn lose a lot of money, and ghosts come out of it, or angels, my life has changed. Yeah, forever. It's like, there's an afterlife. It's, it's like, it's a Constantine thing then? Then you know that, that ghosts and angels exist, that you know there's an afterlife, so then the belief is there? Are you getting Constantined? There's no way you're not. Like it changes every single thing you think of, and you're gonna get just flooded not with people that want to see a good baseball game, but with people like scientists and just every single facet of any person ever. Careers are gonna change. People are gonna stop. Like I think people would like genuinely stop going to psychics because there's no need to now, yeah. right? There's an afterlife. The, what is it? The Long Island psychic? She's out of a job. Like that's that's the or stat whatever the psychics are out of a job. People are going to stop looking to different methods of like extending their life. Like it's just it's going to get really crazy really quick. How many baseball like do you think someone's going to do a like like they're going to have a soybean crop and they're just going to mm-hmm. take and put a football field in it, just hoping <laughs> that some of the greats come back? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't see why not. I'm I'm not going to lie. I'm genuinely surprised after, what, last year when they did a Field of Dreams baseball game that they haven't tried to do, like, a, an NFL professional football game at, like, a high school field or, like, a rec league football field that's, like, kind of run down, but it's still, like, a decent enough field. I'm genuinely surprised they haven't gone for that yet. Imagine you build that field and it's just the Frighteners and you just get Peter Jackson to ghost. <laughs> If you build it, they'll come. Yeah, we will. And it's like, oh, never mind. <laughs> I'm actually tearing it up and replanting it. Well, it's not planted yet. We're it's, hanging out. Get the seeds. Get the seeds. <laughs> and and then it makes you wonder, too, how long have they been in the field? Have they always been there? Is it just they popped up out of the ground to get there? Are they coming down from on high to get There's, I now have so many questions about this. Remember? And why a baseball field to pull them out? I mean, obviously, they're baseball players, but, like, what is the – and then, uh, like, and are they just hanging out? Like, hey, he's got a feel. Let's uh, hold on. He's got to lay the chalk down. We got to know where the, the foul ball lines are. Let's just wait. How about now? Nah, I need to see a hot dog vendor first. I need those SK quality Franks. Don't <laughs> don't make me come out there just yet. What's more frightening to you? So there's that movie in the tall grass, and we've talked about this, with a an, uh, really jerky Patrick Wilson wearing a polo and, and a mustache. <laughs> What's more frightening? You're walking by a reed field, and you have the killer from Memories of Murder, Patrick Wilson, in a pastel polo and a mustache, or a raptor. And I'll give you daytime and nighttime, so you have to pick both. I'm going to say Patrick Wilson daytime. (laughs) Uh, 
killer nighttime because if it's a raptor, I'm just immediately going to fall to the ground yeah. and try to do like a bear thing. Soil myself so it doesn't come near me or just I'm, I'm going to die. that easy? I'm plain and simple. I just know <laughs> I know I'm done. Yeah. The other two I could maybe outrun. But, I mean, just daylight and out of nowhere, here comes a dude popping up in a just pastel polo. You're like, what, we yacht rocking? No, probably going to die. Yeah, especially with his creepy smile. Go from yacht rocking to heaven's door knocking very quick. <laughs> and then you're in a baseball field playing with Ray Liotta. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's – I mean, I meant didn't feel the dreams, not current Ray Liotta. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, even even so. Like, yeah, yeah, playing baseball with shoeless – is it – what, is it shoeless Joe Jackson? Is that I his name? I believe so, yeah. Yeah. Shoeless, shoeless. Yeah, you're playing baseball with him and Kevin Costner. Just hanging out. And Abe Lincoln and mm-hmm. an alligator and yep. Carl Weathers from Happy Gilmore because mm-hmm. there's that scene where they're all waving at him. And mm-hmm. Anakin Skywalker. Which which version? Oh, Hayden, man. Hayden. Okay. I'm just checking. Just H-train. 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 <laughs> Speaking of hating Christensen, the first time I saw Jumper was in Korea. I had just moved out there in 2000, South Korea. I just moved out there, was lost. It was cold. I was freezing. It was February, and I'm from Florida. And I walked all day, got lost in the in the town I moved to, found a movie theater, watched Jumper. It's probably one of my favorite movies just because of that experience. Yeah. And that's, yeah. Uh, you know, so speaking of South Korean cinema, you know, we're talking about Memories of Murder today, and a, a an absolute banger. I mean, one of the highest ranked movies on IMDb. It's now becoming like everyone who wa- it's un- it's unbelievable. The ensemble staging, the usage of color, the desaturation, the performances. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful movie. And also like the way that he directs your eyes. Like I didn't even notice all the red, green, and blue the first time I watched it. I had to watch a video on it that showcased like how he hides everything in plain sight. And I went, oh. Then I watched it again. I went, ah. But. South Korean cinema. When when did you start getting into South Korean cinema? I got into South Korean cinema with Parasite. Uh, everybody had been talking it up and talking it up. I'm like, all right, let me check this out. Saw it. I very much enjoyed it. And I actually went recently, a couple months ago. Oh, I can't remember the name of the film. It's about a family and like an adoption type thing. Broker? Broker. That's yeah. what it was. I saw a broker. I That was gorgeous and I had a fun time. But oddly enough. When Parasite was going on, all of a sudden I feel like everybody rediscovered Memories of Murder. Like yeah. all of a sudden they got back on everybody's radar. Criterion put uh, their version out, which is uh, what I now own. It. Yes, yes. I uh, The AMC near me was doing a Fathom Events, and they were showing this movie. And I'm like, okay, cool. They were going to have like a little Q&A thing pre-filmed with him uh, with uh, Bong Joon-ho afterward. I'm like, this is going to be great. So I go in. I take my seat. The movie starts, and it's I'm so blown away at how gorgeous it looks, and I'm just so enthralled with everything that's happening on screen that I realize it's in South Korean, but there's no subtitles. And I'm like, this is interesting. So I go out into the lobby, customer service desk, and I said, hey, I'm in this theater. We're watching you know, Memories of Murder. Uh, there's no subtitles. And they say, yeah, because it's a foreign film. I'm like, no, I understand that. <laughs> But there's no subtitles on it now. They're like, yes, because it's a Korean foreign film. I'm like, you. I don't know if you're understanding me or not. I can't enjoy. I don't know what's happening. And they're like, we don't know what to tell you. It's a foreign film. I'm like, what? <laughs> okay. So I go back in. I sit down, and I'm like, you know what? Let's just try to enjoy this and and see visually if the story can come across without the dialogue. And the further in I got, I'm like, man, I'm really enjoying this. But I think I would enjoy it that much more. If I knew what the hell they were talking about. So unfortunately, I left early, didn't see it, uh, and then I finally picked up a copy at home and blown away. I truly wish I could have seen it in theaters because I think it would have been that much more powerful. But still seeing it with the uh, Criterion uh, uh, remaster and, and, and everything like that was just just astounding, just astounding. It's such a gorgeous but brutal, brutally gorgeous film. And yeah. it does so much, and a lot of what they do doesn't click until you get further into the film. And some stuff kind of corkscrews, some things overlap each other, and you're like, oh my – like it's it's just – it's it's Memories of Murder, man. Beautiful movie. And it, yeah. and uh, it's so layered. Like this is one of these episodes where I think you and I could just talk about the individual se- – because this is – for lack of a better term, at least for me, this feels like a hangout pick. Because you go from scene mm. to scene to scene to scene to scene to scene to scene. There's very you, – you're there's obviously a narrative through line, but it takes place over years. It takes place mm-hmm. over a long time. 
but like it's just various scenes and you watch them all sort of fall apart but it's just such a good movie to sit and get absorbed in and it's not overly violent but you feel the violence it's almost yeah. like manhunter what like we talked about where mm-hmm. it, it you feel the violence but you, it's not totally you know when the scene when they're pulling out the peaches i feel like in another movie it would be much more graphic you would have the unwanted gratuitous nudity you would have the the cadaver like that but then this is you would hear the sound and like these creepy kind of yeah just disgusting like kind of noise to kind of over exaggerate what's going on to really force you to feel the thing it's a lot like uh scarface scarface when they got him tied up in the motel spoilers and they're getting ready to hit him with the chainsaw people think that's the most brutal thing you don't see anything you see a little bit of blood and it cuts away that's what this film does this film makes it seem so much more worse and violent even when they're talking to the one potential witness and he's flashing back to what was happening like it's really really intense but they don't really show you what's happening they give you enough they give you some breadcrumbs and you know they show uh corpses afterward but from afar so you're not getting like really graphic and in there but it's still enough to make your mind run wild and you're just it's it's just you're here you're elevated you're tense the entire time and it doesn't let you go never and i think the ensemble staging does a great job of that too there's a lot of essays on youtube about this and and uh, bong joon ho has talked about this where some scenes you just have boatloads of coverage. We're talking just why master, why close up, like extreme close up. Then oh, we're getting tension, blah blah. Like this one, it tells different stories through the ensemble staging, the way they frame them in there, the way that the four cops are looking at the suspect when they catch the third suspect, and they are mm-hmm. they are uh, looking at him like that. I just think it's really beautiful. Like when they're looking at Young Yu. He's on one side, then you have the four of them on the other, and the way they blend into the background and the desaturation doesn't feel inorganic to the story it feels organic because you're seeing what he wants you to see you see that the detectives are clothes blend in with the backgrounds the way that color is used and man this is such a good movie and you know what's kind of crazy is this came out so i first started watching korean cinema around i think 2004 2005 when i went to my buddy's house matt we call him kahuna and he was the guy who always had like layer cake he had he was Mm. the guy who would have old boys like mark watch this we sat down and watched Old he Boy. He was your Sherpa. Yeah. He was like, here you go. And I watched Old Boy, and I went, oh boy. Like, this is <gasps> amazing. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Park Chan-wook, you know, like, is, is an amazing director. And then you, then in 2006, my buddy Zach Beckler, Beckler, he was like, hey, man, there's a really cool Korean film playing, South Korean film playing called The Host. So in 2006, we both lived in St. Pete, but we drove to Tampa to go see The Host. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. And then I moved to South Korea for a year, kind of fell in love a little bit more with the movies, came back, the good, the bad, the weird. I, you know, I had to do a Park Chan-wook versus Bong Joon-ho Rotten Tomatoes versus episode. So I went through their whole cinema. I went through, you know, I just watched The Villainess and Carter. Like, I just, I really dig South Korean cinema. But I hadn't, for some reason, this kept slipping underneath my radar. I don't know why. It just, it didn't, it didn't happen until maybe a couple of years ago. Like, oh, no, it didn't happen until... You know, so I, I kind of yeah, it just slipped under the radar for a long time, and I just love this movie now. It's it's such a it's really I, I just showed it to my students yesterday. This clips from it to kind of get them thinking about staging and color, and they were all like, "Holy crap!" Like it's such a beautiful film. And he was relatively young at the time when he directed yeah. this. Like it's what a second film he put out. Yeah, because he had uh, oh man, shoot something about sorry, I didn't mean to put the, you hungry dogs, like hungry dogs. Oh, it's like barking something around. Barking dogs don't eat. Barking dogs don't bite. Barking, wait, barking dogs never bite. Jesus, we yeah, got there. So went and watched that, and it, and you know he only had that under his belt, and then you come out with this movie, which to have the confidence to do the framing, the, the just they had to shoot those reed fields first because they were gonna plow them afterwards, just to get the performances that they did and the trust in the actors hmm. the way they did, it's. Yeah, it's just a legit – and the commentary is hilarious. There's three commentaries on the Criterion Blu-ray disc. There's a hundred and – there's like over a two-hour documentary about it. It's, in, it's insane how much stuff there is about this movie, but it's worth it. This is a movie worth studying, and and I hate to say this, but like this is a movie that you could totally film bro over. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I think most of the movies that are film broed are actually really good, but they get a bad name because of the said film bros. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or, but you could totally just analyze this movie and be about this movie because it's a treasure. It's wonderful. It absolutely is. And it's one of those films that it's kind of a reignition. My first introduction to Korean cinema was Old Boy. And after seeing that, I wanted to f- see more. I wanted to see, you know, I Saw the Devil, Mother, uh, uh, fil- The Host, films like that. But I never really put myself out there to see it. Not that I was against foreign film or, you know, subtitles and whatever. I, it just never did it for me. But seeing Parasite, seeing Broker, seeing Memories of Murder, it's really giving me that itch to like, well, what else am I missing out on? I've only been really checking out two directors worth. Let me see, you know, what else is going on. And it's made me a big fan of Song Kang Ho. Like, I, whenever he's in a film now, I'm like, oh, I like that guy. Like, just immediately, it kind of like, here we go. And then it's just enjoyable, you know? One person did, uh, so someone just put one actor, four great movies. And I was going to do Song Kang Ho, but I ended up doing Keith David instead because he has a jet ski action scene in Transporter 2. He's not in it, but Jason Statham does. But he's in a movie with a jet ski action scene. So I did They Live, Can't Clockers, The Thing, and Transporter 2 for Keith David. But I started looking through... Song Kang Ho's from filmography and just thirst, Snowpiercer, Broker, The Host. I mean, just an absurd, a parasite, it just an absurd amount, emergency declaration that uh, Wellgo USA released last year. Just the, oh, the good, the bad, the weird. Mm-hmm. Amazing movie. See? And Bringing it back. It's, like, the guy has been in some absolute bangers. And he's he, very versatile. Very much so, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, and it's one of those things where when you start to see him more and more, you're like, wow, I wish he was in more stuff. But at the same time, you don't want to worry about that oversaturation where it's like, okay, he's in this movie. I expect this type of, you know, film, but it might be something completely different and then has the potential to sour you on it, you know? And that's one thing that worries me sometimes. Like I love Tom Hardy and I have a certain expectation when he's in a film, but I also at the same time have to dial it back because I know He's going to do, you know, slightly different things in each film, and I don't want to ruin and sour that for me. So I'm always going to take a little bit of time before I go, like, delving into there. Yeah, you don't want to water down. Like, you don't want Tom Hardy in This Means War. You want Tom Hardy in... Bronson. Bronson. (laughs) Yep, Bronson. That was the first movie that came to our mind. Hell yeah. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. just, you want that, because I love actors out there who are... I I feel like my favorite actors are... I think the underappreciated ones who don't probably get the love that they should have gotten, mm-hmm. like you know, Regina Hall or John Leguizamo or Bruce Campbell or Dolph Lundgren or even Kurt mm-hmm. Russell. Like Kurt, everyone loves Kurt Russell, but like I don't think Kurt Russell was – I don't know. But it's it, – but I also love the actors who are out there taking chances. So I think Song Kang-ho, like Thirst. You watch Thirst. That movie is taking a chance. Like that's mm-hmm. a big swing right there. You got Tom Hardy. I think – I've loved Aubrey Plaza recently. I th- I feel like she is down <laughs> for whatever, uh, and so I I dig that about her. So yeah, I, he's just a guy that like you wouldn't even recognize him in certain movies. It's just so yeah. versatile. And his jump kicks, he did that on the fly, and the guy just went with it. The actor that was our first really? day of filming on Memories of Murder when he when he jumped up, when he jumped. Okay, so when he jumps up and he kicks Tae uh, Tae Te- 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 like the the actor King King Sang Kyung, he didn't even though that was coming. So he just got leveled by a jump kick and he just and there's went with it. There's a handful of jump kicks in this too. Oh. I was very surprised at just how aggressive the police were yeah. like just smacking the hell out of each other, smacking the hell out of victims. I'm like, is this a real thing? Like, and then again, you know, it takes place further back in the, in the late eighties. Sure. But I mean, my goodness, like it's, it's, it's such an interesting film to see it from that aspect with like the kicks and kind of just being unhinged because it's, a reverse detective thriller story, right? We're following the cops that are a little corrupt, the ones that are pushing the laws and pushing the boundaries for what their job is. They're like, I don't care who did it. I just need to know. I need to find somebody that did it and send them away for it. And then you have this guy coming from Seoul who is, we don't spend too much time with him, but he's the guy that's kind of like, why are you doing it this way? I'm the, you know, the good cop straight lace. I'm doing it by the book. This is how you be a detective. But we never get to him, you know. It's uh like a reverse hot fuzz, you know. Because Simon Pegg's character, yeah. And then you have to at the very end, it just you know I don't know if it's you know nature versus nurture. If he's finally just become unhinged, he's like this has to be the guy. Like there's no way it's not. And it's such a downer ending, 
not just because of the investigation and trying to find that guy, but also that character. And to see him finally break and become just this broken person and all he wants is is an answer. Whether it's the right one or not, he wants an answer. And you just don't get it. When he sees that Band-Aid, when he, you know, I think, yeah, he just, and also too, I mean, you live in that world that long mm-hmm. and this person gets away with all this stuff and there's so much red tape and there's so little help. They can't get extra bodies because they're, they're squashing a, a, a university protest, a, a student protest. There's, yeah, there's tractors running over footprints. There's, there's just, uh, you know, kids picking up underwear. It's a, it's almost a. Mm-hmm. They're, they actually play it for laughs. Like the chief falls down the hill. It's it's a comedy. In the of very errors. beginning, yeah. yeah. And and it's a comedy of errors. And just imagine that you don't have the help you need. Nope. You don't have the resources you need. And you're up against evil. Like I think you know the, they actually caught the person who did all this. He was actually in prison for something else. They didn't catch him. He was in prison for something else. They found they had new DNA. They found a new way to track DNA, and they found out the guy who was already in prison did the murders, and then he admitted to him. And he watched mm-hmm. Memories of Murder, and he said he felt nothing towards them, which is kind of crazy. But why well, is a sociopath? But you, you watch these movies, uh, you, and it's pure evil. It really is. Yeah. And so you are these cops who are understaffed and overworked, and you don't have the resources, and you're up against evil. Like I think in the you know in the eighties too. Like you don't have the cell phones, you don't have that. So it's man, it. I, I feel like years out after years of dealing with it, you just want some closure, even if it's not real closure and it'll put yeah. someone innocent into jail. Yeah. At no point do they have a handle on anything. No. Even when they start to figure out like the postcards and they start to finally get to that witness and he ends up spoilers getting taken out by a train, which I did not see coming was insane. That's some, uh, spoilers for, uh, you know, hereditary. That's some hereditary stuff. When all of a sudden, you know, Paul head is just gone. You see these characters, and from the beginning, it's chaos. He has a child that's mimicking him while he's looking for this body. You have people running around in this field. He can't keep the reporters away. Kids are running around, and it, it is played for laughs. And it's a weird, almost Wes Anderson type thing, the way the camera kind of follows them along, and it becomes very cyclical when it goes around. But then it becomes – you have these people just embroiled in chaos – but then you have a massive step back when it's just one person standing in a field, and it is truly a sea of loneliness. They are absolutely alone. They have no help. They have no clue what they're doing or where to go. They might as well have thrown them in a rowboat in the fog and said, hey, go north, and they have no idea where north is. That's a great point, too, because uh, Bong Joon-ho said that with this movie, he wanted to address the limitations of our nation and society through the film by portraying the tragic losses of the inspectors who worked on the case. The fresh Face director, he said – like he wanted to show the limitations because they had to send the 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 DNA to America. Mm-hmm. They had to send and like they they had to wait a long time for that. Like they there's just so there's yeah it's just so he wanted to kind of write about that and I thought that was pretty interesting. Like that's what he wanted because he was part of student protests when he was in school. Like he was around in oh, the eighties. Yeah, so yeah. he was around when these serial like these killings were happening and, and the amount of man hours spent on this serial killer. I think they did the math, and it was just millions of hours trying to catch this person. But I mean, you have the rain, you have the the, the country. Like, in I mean, I guess there's so many movies that like. I guess when we have serial killer movies, you have Texas Chainsaw Massacre, middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Psycho, mm-hmm. middle of nowhere. Memories of, Memories of Murder, middle of nowhere. So it's yeah, just I don't know. It's just. But what's yeah. crazy is it's it's really. Not in the middle of nowhere. There's this big town and everything is so interconnected. When characters are chasing each other, you're like, oh, I had no idea the field was so close to this restaurant. Oh, I had no idea the woods were so close to this. And everybody's there, but they're just so alone. They are personally on their own little islands or in the middle of nowhere. And when they finally get a chance on something, they pounce on it to make it work, but they pounce too hard. Literally, they're beating up uh, potential uh, uh, – suspects they're they're going just above and beyond and it hurts to see it because again you want to root for the detectives you want to say let's get that killer but the methods behind it you're like i can't really get behind this so when this guy comes in he's like we're going to do this by the book you know i'm coming in from the big city we're going to solve this thing and to see him slowly break down like this would be a great double feature uh with seven 
very similar ways and how there's like little clues here with like the music and everything, a little bit of rain. And then you have, you know, uh, Brad Pitt's character, this fresh faced detective. He's trying to be by the book and he just slowly becomes unhinged because of what the case is doing to him. I mean, you don't have the detective, you know, the old guy that's on his way out. Sure. But you still have that camaraderie between the two. You still have the two that are trying to learn about each other and understand each other. And I just can't get there yet. And it's it just becomes so intense at times. I, it's just oh, and I love the by the by the book the kind of he's always reading in the background. Like whenever whenever he's on screen, like you just see him in the background reading, which is um, uh, Taeyun is is always actually reading and trying to figure this thing out. And then you have Duman who who if I look you in the eyes, I will know that. But when he looks at the rapist, he doesn't know. When he looks at other people, he doesn't oh. know. And even fakes knowing in one scene with the red underwear because he saw it. Yeah. Like he fakes it. So you kind of have this instinct versus by the book, and they're mm-hmm. clashing. But neither is really working because they can't be everywhere at once. Right. They can't – like when it rains, like, crap, it's raining. Uh, we got to cover a lot of ground, and we mm-hmm. don't have the help to do that. So it's no. – it's, yeah, and then just watching them sort of come together at the end and and the train I mean that train sequence with the tunnel with the way the light is on Hyung Gyu and like the way the light is on Dumont and like how rain is falling on one and rain isn't falling on the other. It's oh man. I know I knew this episode was gonna become this because I'm like, I just love this movie and I could yeah. keep talking about why like why everything is so great. And and that there's nothing wrong with that because very rare, I was telling my students this the other day, very rare is there a movie that when I watch it, I love it. And then I watch the video essays on it and I realize I learned more about it. Mm-hmm. And I go back and watch it. I'm like, whoa, I didn't even see that. And it's yeah. not because I was watching, I, you know, I was looking on my phone. I'm invested in the movie. But when I found out that just, just all like all the usages of red, green and blue in this movie and the, mm-hmm. the folders in the office and the way that everyone blends in, it blew my mind because he wanted to direct the, our attention. He like Bong Joon-ho wanted to emphasize what is important. Like he wanted to lead our, like he wanted to guide us and it worked. I think in so many movies, when there's production design, that's out of place. It takes you out of it. I was never taken right. out of this movie, despite the fact that there's so much prevalence of mm-hmm. certain colors. And it's, yeah, that's exciting for me because you know, you don't see it that much. And one of my students asked me a question. They went, Mark, like here's this movie where this movie's littered with these colors and they're quite subtle. And, in what like then like what's the difference between this and Wes Anderson and how he just bashes you with late lately bashes you with pastel mm-hmm. but I think they're both really smart because Wes Anderson puts you in that world immediately then you you're, right. you just adjust to it like you're not you're no longer being taken out by the pretty mm-hmm. colors because that's mm-hmm. the entire world right well then this one he sort of hides those he hides them in plain sight. And it's a really interesting way to tackle two auteurs and the usage of color and how they tackle it. And it's just fun to watch. Absolutely. It's like when you have uh, the oranges in The Godfather, right? Or when you have the X's in The Departed, stuff that you don't see until you're doing a second watch. And like you said, it guides your eyes. It's similar to Children of Men. When you watch Children of Men the first time, you're paying attention to the foreground. But then when you watch it again, you start to see little bits and pieces in the background. And you're like, there's two stories going on at once. And it never dawned on me before. And I'm very much looking forward to watching some essays on this, the documentary on this, because I've become just such a fan of this film on just on the first watch based on even if I now I wish I would have stayed in the theater and just watched it, you know, not really knowing what's going on just from the visuals alone. It's so stunning. Some of these shots and it feels like they're kind of leaning on this idea of them standing alone in a field. But it just works so well. And then they invert it on you, right? When you have the character that's walking through and it's raining out and they're looking around with the flashlight and all of a sudden this head just pokes up. The last time my jaw fell on the floor watching a movie was uh, Navalny uh, earlier this year, the documentary about the Russian politician and everything. I think it's what it's called. But it, it my jaw literally fell on the floor. And watching this, it just fell. And I, it took me a little bit to like realize, oh, my jaw is open and I'm near gasping at what's happening. Let me readjust here because it just – it grabs you and it doesn't let go. Even in moments where you think like, man, that's kind of slow. What's the point of this? It never feels tedious 
and it never feels like it's doing it for the sake of doing it. When you look back at it, every little piece makes sense, even if it's not in the moment. And as big a piece as you think it is, it might end up being a little thing. As little piece you think it is, it might end up being a big thing. Or just the way they hear certain things again. Like originally they're like, oh, this guy did it. Like, no, he saw it. And then you bring that back. And it's just it's just because then you start getting excited. Your hands start getting a little sweaty and you're invested. Like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And it's just it, – it beats you down really because there's no win. With the detectives, and we kind of touched on it earlier, instinct versus by the book – it's not like this is a film where instinct wins out and then the book wins out and you're like, well, really, what's the best? Where's the dichotomy? How do we decide, you know, what should we trust and and have that as a conversation? None of it works because sometimes it's just it's just chaotic, not like nihilism where nothing matters, but it's just chaos and you can't figure it out. Like it's just it's nothing's working. And what do you do? You know, you just retire and you sell juicers. Yeah. Yeah, which it, it kind of hurt to see that, too, because I'm like, man, he got it. I understand why I would have done something very similar. Sure, just be like, I, I can't keep you know living life like this and going on, especially you know when you see the things that you've seen, it's kind of hard to get away from it. But it's it just it, it breaks your heart a little bit, especially when you get at the end. The gorgeous train scene, but it's a heartbreaker. Yeah. It's really a heartbreaker. And I, I also I also really love how they introduce – like one of my favorite parts is when they introduce uh, Young Gu, uh, the the third suspect in the mm -hmm. in the factory because it's just surrounded by this the like what the green and just the like how he's introduced and also too in the interrogation room the 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 first the first suspect what uh, Quang Ho he was in all white and then the second one uh, what Bian Sun he was in white and red and then when they interview the third guy you know Young Gu he's just in gray matching in like they do. So he's just as ambiguous as they are in regards to morality and like how they're becoming and how they blend in. It's, I don't know. I think it's cool. I think it's really neat. And then just the way that one, you know, at the end he's getting light on him, even though he's in the dark tunnel and we find out that it wasn't his DNA. It wasn't conclusive. It's got to hurt though, because you're him. You are guilty. You mm -hmm. call the station, you send postcards in, you're out, you disappeared. Like it's, ah, geez, Louise. It's like in Zodiac, right? Yeah. When they get Arthur Lee Allen, the John Carroll Lynch character, he's in there, and there he's in. A, it's a factory thing. He comes walking in. The watch is there. The boots are there. Literally every single piece of evidence is there. And you even have Jake Gyllenhaal's character, Robert Graysmith, looking him in the eyes and being like, "I, I know it's you. Like I absolutely know it's you." And then walking away from it. So now it's making me think like a good triple feature yeah. would be – or even just a double being like Zodiac and Memories of Murder because it's very similar paths. Again, not just saying you have the rain, but the rain starts to play a part in in a lot of this, and it's just – what a good movie, man. How do you feel about what Zodiac a good movie. after watching love Memories Zodiac. of Murder? Like after watching Memories of Murder and then you go back and watch Zodiac, there's a lot of sim similar DNA. I mean, every movie, yeah. has, so many movies have similar DNA. Sure, sure. Yeah. But I remember watching Zodiac and just being like, oh, my gosh, the pacing, the the Zodiac, the different kills, like w the breathing, the mm -hmm. they didn't get them, the research, the the drive for that. And then you see Memories of Murder and they feel pretty close. But I mean, one Fincher has a much different lens than Bong Joon-ho does, so. yeah. but they still have that same DNA. To get, I, I feel like they have a lot in common. And I think both of them weren't... I mean, Memories of Murder was beloved when it came out in South Korea. But it's not until Parasite came out when... Let's let's just say not film buffs, but yeah. people who... You know, hey, Bong Joon-ho, what else has he done? Like those kind of... Mm -hmm. Like people who like cinema, like foreign films, they just <laughs> haven't heard of it. Because, right. I mean, at least in my... At least who I hung out with, it was... You know, for me, it was mostly about the action films that came came over. So you from all, from all over asia you get you get the battle royale from japan you get you get the raid from indonesia like th those are the movies i was watching with tai guk ji from uh from korea so and jack you know jackie chan's police story from hong kong it, it's very rare that i guess i would sit down to go watch you know uh, this crime thriller because i was just like i want to go watch the raid like, I, I yeah. guess I'll just watch the uh, old boy or the vengeance trilogy. So uh, I, I, this and Zodiac, I think are really becoming more esteemed. Like th they've, 
you know, I saw Zodiac and I loved it. So I've always loved it, but I don't think it did well in theaters because Zodiac's not a movie that does well in theaters. No, no, no. It, it's long, but it's supposed to be long. It's supposed right? to drag you down, take your power bars all the way to yes! zero. Yeah, because that's exactly what it did to these characters and what it did to Robert Graysmith, even though he's just a cartoonist. It's it's pulling him in and drawing him down. We see Robert Downey Jr.'s character get broken down to literally a man that's on an oxygen mask because of. I mean, all the cigarettes, sure, but he's like slowly kind of just his health is deteriorating. Mm-hmm. But the big difference for me is Zodiac, as a viewer and as I'm paying attention to these characters, there were moments where I felt like, oh, they're in danger. Like this is going to be yeah. serious. Like the yeah. moment where he's like, not many ba- uh, houses in California have basements. He's like, mine does. And it's like, what yeah. is – or San Francisco, whatever. And then this one, the only real time you feel danger is sure when you get the POV – of the of the the killer as he you know hunts and and uh, goes against his victims, but it's that scene in the field where the head pops up. You, it's a terror more than it is a danger, and you're scared. But those two play very very similar and very close to the chest that way, and it's it's just well done. I, I guess I do love. There, there's some lines in this movie that I love, like when 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 what Dumont's told that that like you dump shit on cooked rice like that makes like one of the it's like a crazy line and they do make it worse though i think by i guess by torturing innocent victims who clearly aren't mm-hmm. guilty yeah and then posing for it on the newspapers and then beating him up in a field and then realizing that the guy's innocent but i mean and then the guy who kicks with his right leg young ku gets tetanus in his right leg from a nail from a guy that mm-hmm. he did abuse. Sorry, this is my my bu- so this movie. There's so many scenes that are great in this movie. Yeah. So when I talk about it, I feel like I'm just pinballing all over the place. But I don't mm-hmm. care. Like this is this is like why you and I have been on a really neat roll with movies lately. Between Manhunter, Repo Man, and this, they're just mm-hmm. thrilling to watch. Yeah, they really are. Like watching those man, like watching Manhunter for the first time and seeing those ridiculous wide shots that look amazing by Michael Mann and then seeing the scrappiness of repo man and then watching this and the ensemble staging makes me so happy in this movie, the way that he does that and the way that he tells a story without too much coverage. I mean, coverage is fine. Mm. And I think this was a lot more work. I just think this is a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's very purposeful too. Mm -hmm. And all of it pays off. There's not a single thing I can think of in this film where I watch it and I look later on for the payoff on it and it's not there or just there's every single thing. It's like the wire, all the pieces matter, right? Every little thing that they show you has a purpose. It's a very lean film. It's uh, like some would say like Kubrick or Paul Thomas Anderson. Like they're not just showing it to show you. It means something in there, whether you realize it or not. And sometimes it's, it's overt and you know exactly what it is. And sometimes it's not. And you have to kind of figure out what it is, but it does that healthy balance to where it's not so open ended and mysterious to where you're left being like, Oh no, I think this or I think that. Like, no, it's cut and dry to an extent, but it still leaves a little bit enough intrigue and mystery there. There's enough excitement without there being huge action pieces. There's thrilling engagement and kind of that like tense you know sweaty palms but without the i guess the the visuals are there i really the more i think about it it's the music or lack thereof there is not much score to this film what it's the beginning and the end maybe a piece or two in the center but we are in that moment we are with them in that noise that natural rain that's falling down the crunching of a stick in the woods, all of these little pieces, and we're just there at no point. Because there's a lot of moments watching this where any other kind of director would kind of punch in a music or a drop in order to make you feel something, right? In order to decrease the tension, someone turns on the radio and here's like a Beastie Boys song or here's something else that everybody's singing along to. But we don't get that. We're just left with what's happening in the moment, and we absorb the entire thing, and we feel the emotional weight. We feel the mental drain on it without needle drops and without pushing us and guiding us to feel that way. They let the dialogue do it. They let the cast do it. That's a really interesting thing. He doesn't – he's not really manipulating you with close-ups where it's it's a medium shot, then a close-up, and you're like, oh. Mm -hmm. you got to watch. Like that scene in the bar. I was watching what is it? What is it? One every frame of painting, I believe. Yes. Or one per, like, 
They love have, that guy. I wish he would do more. Like, I love that stuff. They have a video on this on the club scene when they're doing the karaoke. And there's three stories going on in that scene. And it's really neat to watch. And it's just a it's just a wonder. But you have what Duman and, and Taeyun arguing on the table. Mm -hmm. Then you have the chief passed out drunk. And then you have Young Koo f seemingly forcing a woman to like make out with him behind the table. But then they lean in and then it's just the two of them. And then the chief gets up and then uh, Young Koo pops up from the background. Then you have the three of them. Then the focus goes on the chief who mm -hmm. after he pukes and rallies like a boss, he He's That's like, why he's the chief. Yeah, he's like, we got to do this, and you two were fighting, and like, he rallies. But in that one take, you can tell three different stories by placing mm -hmm. your characters in different areas. Like that, the ensemble staging is real, and it, yeah. it, it it's pretty cool how they how he how he does that. And you know, there's a couple of funny moments that I learned. There's a scene where the guy comes in to work on the boiler, and there was mm -hmm. a theory that the guy working on the boiler was the killer because he looks back a couple times. But the actor just did that on the fly because he wanted to get his face in the shot. So the, Bong Joon-ho left it in because he's like, well, he's acting. Good job. So like, mm -hmm. there's theories about that. And I don't know. It's just like, I love the way that they're staged, the frame, the way they are. It's very purposeful, but it's ne it never feels totally manipulative. No. The, and even at the very last scene, the very, very last scene, spoilers, where all of a sudden he just bang, looks right into the camera and stares you down and it grabs you. And then just let you go because here's the credits. That's the only time where you could maybe make the case where it's manipulating you emotionally. Maybe. But it's no different than The Revenant, right? When all of a sudden it's just Leo looking you dead in the eyes and saying, if I don't get an Oscar for this role, <laughs> I'll never get one ever. Like just really staring you down. But this one – and of course he's looking at us with his eyes. He's trying to read – and figure out what do they know? What are they telling the truth? And we're looking at him. What's going to happen with him? Is he going to kind of break and fall back into the case a la Robert Graysmith where all of a sudden he starts breaking it down and tries to redo it? Mm. Like it, it's just – it's so – just so oh, – it's so good. And it doesn't – listen, Zodiac does what it does on purpose. I Saw the yeah. Devil, another movie, takes you there. It's, it's 140 minutes of just – you're basically just getting your stomach punched for 140 minutes. Mm -hmm. This movie at 130 minutes, I don't think it's trying to drag you into no into despair. I think it's – and that's a really interesting thing about it. It's not trying to exhaust you. It's not trying to – it's not – yeah, it's not – I don't think on its agenda, it's not trying to irreversible you. It's not Gaspar mm -hmm. Noe trying – no, you know, like trying to wipe the floor with you. It's not Antichrist or Lars von Trier. It's mm – -hmm. It's, no scissors in this film. Oh, goodness gracious. It's <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. You were on a roll, and I totally yeah. dead to it. It's no the climax scissors. with LSD and just horrifying mm. claustrophobia. But that, that's interesting, though. I, I think that it it never makes – you're kind of – it's just a very good film. <laughs> yeah. It's You're a fly on the wall. Yes. Yeah. You're, you're observing it. It's the hangout thing, right? Mm -hmm. You're hanging out with these people. You're in the room. You're in the field. You're just spending time with them and trying to figure it out along with them. It doesn't – like you've said, it doesn't beat you down. It doesn't drag you along. It doesn't force itself upon you. You're just an observer, almost like a little ghost, like a little spirit just going along, looking for the baseball field. You know what I mean? Oh, this has been – I really believe that this is one of the hardest movies – I've had to like prep for and talk about on movie films and flicks because there's so much out there about every yeah. frame. Yeah. There's so much out there about, you know, he, he hired a, a, a Japanese for the music. He went to a uh, Japanese musician, what Taro Iwashiro to do the song at the end. And he said, it was just like all in vowels and the way they, he had that, like the humming at the end, the way he wanted mm. it. And he's like, yeah, mm. you really got South Korean culture, but like the music, there's documentaries about the music. There's three commentaries, every shot, you know, like the way when the chief falls down the hill, he's centered in the frame so that yeah. your eyes go to that. There, There's there's so much to talk about in this movie. But also, you know, what's interesting is we there's character progression, but this never it's not like Requiem for a Dream where they just all end up in horrible places. Like they're just right. They've been driven to the despair. And so it's not. Yeah, it's just interesting watching these guys and the. Some of these dudes aren't good. Like, mm -mm. like they aren't. But, I mean, they're better than a serial killer. And they're also out of their league. And they seem to have some empathy. But then, I don't know. 
but I don't know. Is there much character development in this movie? I don't like. I don't think there is because this is more about a moment. Um, this is more about memories, right? This is more about moments. I don't think that you know, you know Song Kang Ho's character. He he's still a punk at the end to his kids, and he's talking about the juicers at the end. He doesn't have that much of an arc. We never see like his breakdown about the case mm-hmm. with with Taeyun. He definitely becomes more of a dark side type character, less by the book, less less we're going to catch him by doing everything legal. But we never spend that much private time with him to see the full arc of his character development. It's mm-hmm. more just what like, we're more just watching exactly what Bong Joon-ho said was memories. Like we're getting this this sort of piece by piece, scene by scene recollection, like recreation of these murders and the time. But, but you're like, you know, Zodiac, I feel like he spent a lot more time with the characters, even though he spent yeah. a lot of time with the characters in this one. But it's it, I, it's just very unique. And I'm not saying it's bad or good. Right. I'm just saying it's different in the way that it tackles the progression of the characters. It it there is some regression, but I think this is one of those rare things where it's more just you, we're watching a character discover themselves. We're watching a character that's like you said, kind of faking it through and saying like, oh, I can read somebody's eyes and I know if they're telling the truth. And we can kind of see that, you know, unsuredness inside of them being like, maybe I can't do this. We discover, we watch this character, uh, 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 Taeyun, we watch him discover that he's slowly kind of losing it and becoming his environment around him. And he doesn't really fight it. It just slowly absorbs him. And we watch the chief kind of discover in and out like, hey, you know, this is you know, the reason why we have reporters at her all the time is you guys right here. We have some characters that don't even really discover themselves. We just kind of discover that, oh, they're not really that good a person, especially if they're putting on boot covering. So they leave less bruises on people when they kick the hell out of them. Like it's these little moments that just develop these characters little by little. And then they just become what they've been the entire time. It's kind of like when we talked about Annihilation and the frog in the boiling water kind of thing. So when they finally have that moment where you know it blossoms and the character becomes who they are, we've known who they were the entire time. But now it's just on Front Street and we see it directly and we see the impact of all the little moments that led us there. Look yeah. at us sounding like – historian this is our right, most lucid right. episode and that's for sure i love it dude and and yeah I, I don't even want to riff uh, on this part and <laughs> yeah it just I, I like that it's not overly violent but you still feel mm. it i like that yeah. the movie never feels unhealthy but mm-hmm. it's just despite everything that they're eating and drinking and, and yeah, some of it does not can... look that appealing i've had karaoke nights like that and i've had i, I miss korean barbecues man going out so after i would work from 4 30 to 10 30 at night and and then at 10 30 we would go out for dinner or go to the bar or go our own separate ways but it was always fun when the crew after work we would just go to a korean barbecue and you get the you get some megju you get some soju you get the, the stuff in front of you you get all the food and you just have a nice barbecue night but nice. yeah those night those well, the first night that i joined one of the first things i did when i joined this company the the boss felt like if he took you out and got you plowed he would know your true self so oh, the geez. entire company all the bus drivers all the teachers all the staff because i i taught beforehand so i was able to go to this really nice hogwan the school where i basically just taught kids how to beat the test and they're all fluent in english we just it, it was it was a good really great gig they took everybody out just to get all of us get drunk together so i got to see the true selves of them and they got to see my true self and so we just go out and eat and just eat and drink Go and do karaoke, drink more and eat more, and then go to another karaoke. And then eventually I just ran out of there, got a cab, and went back to my hotel and puked my, my guts out till about, <laughs> I don't know, 6 a.m. But mm-hmm. it, it uh, that night when they're partying, though, and doing the karaoke, and they're leaning on the table, and someone wakes up and pukes. Like, I've seen that before. <laughs> it's just mm-hmm. crazy nights, man. And <laughs> Look how accurate this is. <laughs> yeah, it, it brought back – I mean, sure, you, anywhere in the States you have that, but anywhere in the world you have that. It's not just limited to South Korea, but it brought back good memories of Korean barbecue and talking about going to Seoul and people never going to Seoul. And Seoul always exhausted me, man. I would go there for a couple of days and just – it's just so big. It's such a big yeah. city, man. And then I just wanted to go back to Chongju where I could ride my bike everywhere and I could hike on the weekends. And nice. I, I, yeah, it was that cool. delightful. And I loved all, I, seeing all the mountains, man. Like there's so many mountains in Korea. Like I miss, I miss doing all that. 
And I would never think of Korea as a mountainous country either. So to know that, I'm like, well, this is opening new doors for me anyway. With your time in Korea, because I knew watching this film, I'm like, cool, I can ask Mark this question and we can figure it out. Do Koreans not sleep in beds? Because I feel like I didn't see a single bed in this movie and everybody was kind of sleeping on the floor or laying on the floor, like in some way, shape and form, unless I missed a scene or two. But I was just so just kind of confused. No, I mean, I had beds in my my like I'll, in my apartment we all had beds when i went to other mm. people's houses they had beds when i stayed in hotels oh. out there they had beds but i mean you know maybe maybe smaller places you just don't have that mat so you put it up you know maybe you have a smaller place so you have that mat and you just sleep on it but maybe th- yeah no i mean everywhere i went there were beds okay because yeah. it really stuck out to me i'm like why is he sleeping on the floor why are they having sex on the floor why is it when they find the guy, they think it's him. He's just curled up on the floor. Like why you would think you'd be in bed or on a couch or something like that, but they're not. I'm like, maybe Mark's going to know. I mean, maybe just space, right? Like it, it, you, you maybe you don't have that big of an apartment. So you just have mm-hmm. a nice mat. They'll sleep on it at night. Like it's not. It is a small town. So you're not going to have these big overarching homes that are like the centerpiece of the town or like, you know, looking down on everything. So yeah, you're probably right. It's probably just the size of the home. It's kind of wild. One of my first memories of being in Seoul. So, you know, uh, I was getting off a strep throat and I was just getting better. And I get on an airplane, fly overnight. I can't sleep on planes. I get to Seoul. I get picked up. I get taken to the hotel. The next day we have training. I haven't slept in who knows how long. But as a guy from Florida, and I just hadn't, I wasn't used to giant cities. But Mm -hmm. Seoul, man, with the gigantic apartment blocks, with just the the expanse of it, it was really overwhelming. Mm. So it's, but then I, I always, I'm telling you, man, you you go through the country and then you get to Seoul and it's just gigantic. Yeah. I, I just wanted to go back. I was in Cheongju and I just I loved it. I was in Boon Pyong Dong, and uh, I I liked it because I could I ran up the mountains every weekend. I would take my bike to the movies. My gym, my bank, my job, and my grocery store were right next to each other. Nice. Yeah, I played soccer in in out there i played all over the country uh, oh train to busan like uh, take that train and see the zombies and but mm-hmm. no it, no i mean for most part you know whenever i had to stay in seoul you know i you know i stayed when i was taking my gre i had to go to seoul and i, I, I slept on a couch i remember that mm-hmm. so yeah i don't think i ever that was a crazy night man i got out of work at 10 30 i went and got a bus at 11 30 i got to seoul around one and then I had to take a train and then I had to, I think I had to take another train and then I met a friend of a friend and he let me sleep in his apartment, but then we had to walk about 20 some minutes mm-hmm. and then I, I went to bed maybe 3.30, something uh-huh. like that. And then I had to get up at five. So I got up at five, took a bunch of trains, buses, went to the wrong place, oh. found another guy who went to the wrong place. We showed up at the place. I, I didn't have any pencils, so I found a pencil in the bathroom. <laughs> I ran up. I was like the second to last person to enter. Maybe last. I don't know. Second to last, last person to enter. And then I was like the second person done with the test, and I was really freaked out mm. because I went, oh, no. Like, should I be Should I be done? Like, yeah. I think I'm done. Like, So I just left, and I ended up just getting a bottle of soju sitting on a bus on the way home and just sipping on the soju. Not like crazily. But just sitting there drinking soju, like completely exhausted. And I passed the test. And those was like one of the nut- nuttiest nights of my life, man, out there. Sounds... Isn't Bathroom Pencils one of the albums from Gary and the Rancors? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Dude, it was just sitting there. And I, you know, I'm sorry if I stole it from you if you're listening to this. But yeah, I, I just found a bathroom pencil. And it was already sharpened. It was beautiful. I just took you it. Found a number two and a number two. <laughs> yeah. I took a number two and I found a number two. Oh man, but yeah, no, that was, yeah, and I don't know. I, I wish I, could, I wish I had more to say about this movie than it mm-hmm. is just good. Yeah, but I think there are so many really neat essays out there that I would just be copying what they told me, kind of parroting it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. We've definitely talked about that, but just the vibe of this movie, and and just this is something I want to teach to my students. This is something I want to show to my students. This, you know, I love how in the beginning how. How they're out in the field and it, just how bright it is. It, it's bookended by very bright scenes and then it's very desaturated. But mm-hmm. that's how you, that's how you do it. That's how you use color. That's how you, you create emotions. That's how you guide the audience's eye. Like I do think, 
you know, I, I do think there are really neat ways that you don't directly notice, but are really cool. I can get out in the beginning of the couple, they're wearing blues and grays and jean jackets. And they're basically twins. They're twinsies. When they get to the house, Allison Williams starts wearing a gray shirt with a little touch of red. So thus it's kind of separating herself from, from the oh, character. And at the end, she's in okay. all white wearing the all white outfit, kind of cultish, crisp, clean. So she, you start off the movie where they're basically twinsies. She separates them herself a little bit because that's what she's doing. They're eventually going to, mm-hmm. you know, body swap. And then at the end, she's completely separated from him. But I never noticed yeah. that until I thought about it later and I started looking at pictures. And that that's my favorite. That's, that's the most exciting thing for me in film mm-hmm. is when – I don't know how you watch movies, but I guess for me – With my I, eyes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I use my ears. I smell. <laughs> but it it's – when I watch a movie, I don't look for clues. Mm-hmm. I, I, when I watch Scream, I'm not like, who did it? When right. I watch Malik, I'm like, oh, he's spinning the camera. When I watch, <laughs> which I love, I love Malik. Uh, when I watch Tarantino, I'm like, how many feet shots are there? You know, like, yeah, yeah. even though that's my job, pussies. that's my job for most things is to research movies. Mm-hmm. But I let it just wash over me. And sometimes I, I just, I try not to think about it too much. I, I let the experience hit me. So that's why when I watch it a second time and I'm, I, I'm able to really focus on it and I learn new things, that's when it becomes really exciting for me. Mm-hmm. I don't know how you do, is how do you like what's your style of watching movies aside from with your ears and eyes? <laughs> Mine is um very similar to yours. I'll watch it if it's kind of a mystery who done it. I'll try to like keep an eye out and see if I can pick up on little you know things here and there or like oh I wonder if it's this or wonder if it's that. But I'm not so intently like dialed in and looking at it hardcore. I'm watching it and I'm enjoying the story for what it's kind of like you experiencing it. Now having seen films you know like Children of Men and Kubrick and Paul Thomas Anderson, I'm sometimes keen to see what's going on in the background but there's some films where you just kind of know there's nothing really going on in the background but creed 3 there was a moment where i'm looking in the background of a certain scene and i'm like oh i know what this is going to set up and then it falls into place so sometimes it's it's there for you to see so when you go to look back at it you're like oh that's where it was but sometimes it's not there at all and you just kind of breeze through it. And like you said, you watch an essay or you read something or somebody points it out to you. Uh, and all of a sudden it just changes your perception of the film. And then things start to piece together. But you remember the things that you're piecing together because you've experienced it the first time around. Not that you were looking for it, but your brain acknowledges it that it was there. Absolutely. Kind of like you. And you're thinking like, oh, she went to you know her folks for the weekend. She's just changing outfits. People change outfits all the time. I've been on a long you know seven hour car ride. Kind of want to get out of these pants, or I want to <laughs> change this shirt. And so you do, you know. And and as the weekend goes along, you have your Saturday outfit, your Sunday outfit, and so on and so forth. So you don't really think about it. And then like, why is it that color? Why is it that design? Why is it? you know, wrinkly versus crisp and things like that. It's, and I guess that's how, uh, that's just how I want to watch the movies. It's just absorb it, watch it, Mm -hmm. enjoy it. And then that's when I start discovering the things about it. And, and and it's fun though. I mean, I I do like portrait of a lady on fire or old Henry. I watch those movies and I, I really, during the movie, I wanted to read about the lenses that they used during it. And Mm -hmm. so sometimes you do get really excited about movies, but for me, it's more of, it's less about the background. It's less about finding the killers. It's less about looking for Easter eggs or or hints. For me, I guess I get more excited about the camera angles, the ensemble staging, the the what lenses did they use? Why did they use that lens? What's that location? Mm-hmm. Like that's the stuff that I guess will make me ex- excited in the movie. More about more, I guess I'm more into the making of rather than right. the theory of it or mm-hmm. the the. You know, I think a lot of people are really big into to just. What's this movie trying to tell me? What can I absorb? Right. Is this an allegory for the Vietnam War? Like, that's what people are looking for. Me, I'm like, man, I just love that camera. What kind of camera yeah. is it? What lens is that? Is that a prime lens? Is that anamorphic? Think... Like, why'd they shoot two to one? Why is that one Yeah. Wait, is, it, is this on 35 mil? This is on 35 mil. Wait, this I wonder if Kodak put this stock out. Yeah, that's that's mine. And, like, you know, I'm like, ooh, it's two to one. I love that. I love that. Like, I love that they chose that aspect ratio. So, for me, mm-hmm. it's, I guess that's the way I read it. And, this is one of those movies I just think is is just I don't know it's perfect it's yeah. so good. 
Well, I think that's a smart way to approach it too. You come at it like, man, I love movies. I love film and I'm here to enjoy this thing. Because if you go into a film every single time as a theorist, as a critic, as someone that's like clinically trying to dissect it, you, it starts to lose that magic and it doesn't grab you and it's not fun anymore. Whereas you're watching it and you're just like, oh, that was an interesting shot. I'll, I'll, you know, throw it in the back of my head and think of it later. And then like most of the time, like on a Marvel film, for example, Guardians of the Galaxy 3, roll credits. As I'm waiting for the mid credit stinger, the end credit stinger, I'm pulling up IMDb. I'm on the trivia page, and I'm just reading through and learning about stuff, maybe fall down a rabbit hole, and then boom, your end credit scene, cool, done. I'll go head off into the truck and drive home or, or do whatever because it's just right there, so why not? And then you start to go, okay, that makes sense why they did this, or oh, that's really cool that they thought of it that way, or oh, that's weird, Gary Oldman would have been in this film, but instead they went with Val Kilmer. Something like that to like really get your attention, and then you're thinking, well, I wonder how Gary Oldman would have done this, or oh, wow, he wrote the part for them, no wonder they were so good, stuff like that. Yeah, You can tell when a part's written for that person, too. You really can, and I, you know, I gotta tell you, I think one of the worst things to do when watching movies is to go in, go into it thinking already critically, because mm -hmm. once you start putting your own expectations or, you know, we had a conversation the other day and someone watched Con Air and they're like, well, you know, it's not as good as Die Hard. And it's like, if you go into every single action film comparing it to Die Hard, you, you're, they're not going to be as good. Like if no, you, you're missing out on like, stuff, like, you know, let's say Messi goes and scores 10 goals and you're like, oh, man, that's a great game. He scored 10 goals. And then the next score, he scores five. You're like, oh, that's a shit game. Like, no, he scored five goals. Like, but yeah. that 10 is a blip. That 10 will never happen again. That mm -hmm. 10 happened. And he doesn't even know how it happened. No one knows yeah. how it happened. Maybe someone got a red card. So it, or maybe someone was off. Like, it, you don't know how it happened. And so you don't, when people compare, like, comparing it to other films, or that wasn't as good as, you know, that movie, or... I saw the trailer and I wanted this, but this movie didn't give me what I wanted. Thus, I don't mm -hmm. like it. So that's why I just try to, for me, I just try to watch it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and then later on, I'll put it, I like putting it into context. Okay, this was $13 million to make. This movie was shot in 22 days. This movie had to get shot in this area because of COVID. So mm -hmm. then I like to learn, why was this movie so expensive? Oh, Netflix. So then I watch it, let it wash over me. Then I like to like put it in context of like what it is. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. People can be different from me. Yeah. But that's why I think I can watch so many movies and like a lot of movies because I don't, I'm not comparing them to other things and I'm not. Right. I don't know. And that's why this movie's great is because I don't know what to compare it to. I don't. I, it's it's a it's a wholly unique film. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I think that's also what draws us to you know, stuff like every frame of painting, or there's another guy like watching Thomas. I can't think of his last name, but it's like Thomas something, or, you know, snippets from the screen, but all these different guys, because not only do they have a particular voice and you know what they're going to accomplish, but because they always give something like a little bit different. And that's why I'm drawn sometimes to podcasts, not necessarily who the person is, but the film they're talking about, because maybe they're going to help me take away something it didn't dawn on me before. Like I, the first time I saw Black Klansman, I didn't really care for it. But then someone kind of pointed out like, oh, it's kind of like a role on 70s exploitation films and things like that. And I'm like, oh, well, now it clicks and a lot of things make more sense and it becomes that much more enjoyable upon like repeated watches and things like that. So having these little conversations along the way is fantastic because it does just that. It shows you like, hey, I noticed this thing and you're like, oh, no way. It, it's it's almost similar to like if you go see uh, Big Fat Liar or right. Uh, shout out Paul Giamatti. And you're sitting very close oh, to the screen. You might be – if you're – depending on what side you're sitting on, you might say, oh, that person has banana shoes. That's cool. But the person might not even see the banana shoes because they're over here looking at something else. You know, it, it's little things like that. Then when you have those conversations or you listen to a podcast, even if you don't agree with them, you still get something out of it. I would genuinely love to read a – Leg I don't want to say legitimate, but a true review of the film that's a little more anti that where they didn't like it as much, but not from like, oh, this isn't how police work is or, oh, this was dumb or oh whatever. No, like genuinely. it was overhyped. Exactly. Like why? You know what I mean? What didn't you like? Was it camera work? Was it the lack of score? Was it like what aspect of it didn't you care for? And I'm not going to fight you on it and be like, no way this. But no, I'm just genuinely curious what some people are getting out of it. Versus what they aren't getting out of it. 
because maybe there's a disconnect there or you learn something that you didn't realize before and changes your perception of the film for better, for worse, hopefully for better. I read an essay on the, the Criterion disc that was part of this where the, the person who wrote it, one of their friends will never watch it again because they hate the brutal treatment of the people who are kidnapped. They hate the, mm -hmm. they hate the main characters because of their abuse. So there's people out there who don't enjoy this film mm -hmm. because of the lengths that our quote-unquote protagonists go to to find them guilty. So, yeah, I mean, I, there, there are – but I, I think – so I think that, that's actually an interesting take because – I don't know, but then they're still kind of likable. But they are total – It's a weird gray area, and they let you decide, and some people are going to be on their side, right? Some people are going to go, yeah, sometimes you just need to get that information out of them. Sometimes they're under duress. Uh, what's that one scene where – oh, the cop scene uh, in uh, Reservoir Dogs when he's cutting off his ear, right? He's like, I'm just trying to get information out of him. He's like, if you asked him if he started the Great Chicago Fire, he'd probably say yes. Or just because you get the answer you want doesn't necessarily make it so. You know, we look at things like uh, the Netflix documentary, Making a Murder, right? And how maybe sometimes – you know, people are led into particular answers or I don't want to say trick, but they're just kind of pushed in a particular direction, which they do when they're first getting some uh, testimony and they have it filmed or they're recording it. And they're just like saying, so you did do this thing or, yeah, remember when this happened? And the person's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it goes through and it just kind of shows you that technique of like, you know, there's a desperation there and you can see it in their eyes. You can feel it in the room. And you don't necessarily have to appreciate it or like the character for it, but it just adds to this idea that, like, man, like, they really have no idea what's going on with this murder. They really don't know how to catch them. And like you talked about earlier where the police are heading off for student protests, they have no help. So what are they going to do next? If they keep doing the same thing over and over, which they did, beating up on a, on a uh, potential suspect and everything, it's the definition of insanity, right? It's doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result even though it's the same result. And they never find him. No. Spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, hey, hey, thank you so much for joining me, man. This was, oh God, this was wonderful. You. This is, yeah. normally you and I are joking, uh, but this, this. We got serious. Yeah. We got very passionate about this film. And that's what's great about coming on the show and talking to you about it, is there's times where we can kind of be funny and have that fun along the way. And there's also times where all of a sudden we get very serious and we kind of wax poetic on something. And it's nice to kind of have that dichotomy and know going in, we're going to be like, yeah. And then, you know, he, he drop kicked him, you know, Hulk Hogan, uh, you know, yeah, uh, ultimate warrior. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it's, and that just goes to show the power of the film, right? That it's just such a genuine appreciation for it. And a good couple of our, uh, discussion topics and what we've talked about it always just ended with like it's a good movie <laughs> it's a great film like it's yeah. just we keep coming back to that same spot and it's just it's just so enjoyable to have that this is one of the weirdest experiences because i put so much research into this episode but i just kept saying it's a good movie it's a mm -hmm. it, it does an odd effect to it it's it's an it, it's been a that's why i like the show though I, I like the different movies i like i like talking about the different films and seeing how the conversation was unfold, and I, yeah. I dug this, man. So thank you for joining me. Where can people thank find you? Thank you for having me. People can find me. Uh, I'm on Twitter. Not Twitter. Excuse me. Not I'm in on the field, Instagram. Hopefully. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, not in the reed field. Especially with all this rain. It's You know what I mean? It's kind of yellowy yeah. and dry. You're going to get itchy with the bugs. Yeah. Like, oh, gosh. No not thanks. a fan. Yeah, I hope your crops um, do better. Thank you. Thank you so much. You can find me outside hoping for rain. Uh, I'm on Instagram at that rehack, just kind of goofing around, uh, funny pictures, pictures of my cats, etc. And you can also find me on my podcast, a little bit different from movies. Uh, myself and Bubba Wheat host Lyrical Innuendo. And each episode, we take a look at a song and we try to determine, is it about sex, drugs, or is it just rock and roll? Our most recent episode, uh, as of this recording, we took a look at Fatboy Slim's uh, Weapon of Choice. And we had a very, very lengthy discussion about is the song really telling the story of Dune? And it was a fascinating take because they do have the line, walk without rhythm, you want to track the worm. Yeah. But we're breaking down all of the lyrics, and it's really clicking together like this is something more than what it is. What's cool is if you catch the episodes on Spotify, Spotify is allowing us to play the actual song in the episode. So you can go through, listen to the song, and be with us. Uh, some of the other websites might not have that chance, so there'd be a little bit of a disconnect. But overall, it's a really fun time. Check it out, Lyrical Innuendo. 
Oh man, and those those blinds are hitting you. The light from the blinds is just hitting you really nice? well right now. Yeah. It's like that prison thing where all of a sudden, like I'm in a cell and I just turn and like the lights through the bars are kind of coming through. Well, I'll make sure to share it on this episode and actually I'll uh, share it on MFF Facebook and and yeah, awesome. That sounds like a great episode. Yeah, it's a it's a really I had a really good time. I mean, come on now. It's yeah, that one's blatant, <laughs> but there's other ones that they say and I'm like, I really like the spice. <laughs> Sorry. Essentially, it's it's nuts. <laughs> But it's it's such a good time. We laugh, we carry on, we dig deep into it. We don't get as poetically waxing as we did this episode, of course, but uh, it's still a good time. Listeners are confused right now. And go back and listen. And also, y'all go back and listen to our Tron Legacy uh, Color Purple. No, not Color Purple. Purple, purple Rain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. And go back and listen to our Purple Rain and Tron Legacy episode. That's our number, our most popular episode of the last two years. So it just keeps getting That's really listens. cool to hear. That's really, really cool to hear. It keeps getting listens. I think new subscribers just come across and go, what? <laughs> oh, I didn't know. <laughs> Wait, I like both of these. <laughs> <laughs> Two great tastes. Tastes great together. <laughs> Let's do it. All right, well, what a uh, feature. thank you for joining me, man. This was awesome. Thank you so much, Mark. All right, so for me, Mark Hoffmeyer, for Nick Rehack, this is Moves of the Flicks. We'll see you next week. <laughs>